We are all of us in a whitewater world. And the whitewater is getting bigger and it's getting more turbulent. And five years from now, it's going to be bigger yet and it's going to be more turbulent. By whitewater, I'm not referring to your Schuylkill, but rivers south of here, maybe the Great Falls of the Potomac, or the streams that tumble out of the Appalachians, or the great western rivers that are fed by the snowy Rocky Mountains. The use of whitewater here is not by accident. My wife and I are whitewater kayakers, whitewater boaters, and we've made several trips down the Grand Canyon. On our first trip, we paddled with more experienced boaters. And each night in camp, we'd pour over the river maps. We wanted to make sure we were prepared for all the rapids coming the next day. And the next day, as we approached the major rapids, my mind almost inevitably went blank. I was in a terror. And I'd turn to some of the more experienced boaters and say, how do we run this again? Do we go left or do we go right? And what are the problems we need to avoid? And those boaters invariably gave me the same answer. Take the glassy tongue into the big boil and maneuver as necessary. I thought these guys were just having fun with me. And there was a right way and a wrong way to run a rapid. I knew that. But over the course of several days, I got used to it, and I decided that they were quite right. None of us, after we hit that boil, were going to be in exactly the place we expected to be, and we did have to maneuver as necessary. I wanted to be on the left side of the river. I found myself on the right. I wanted to be facing downstream, and I found myself facing upstream. I looked for a calm eddy. I couldn't find one. I'd get knocked over. I'd have to roll up. I'd be on top of a wave for a moment, and I'd have a clear vision of what was coming my way. And then I'd be in a trough, and I'd see nothing but green water, not knowing what I was going to be into in five seconds. One experienced boater, probably the best boater on our trip, we found ourselves scouting at the top of one of the three biggest rapids. And he said, why don't you and I run this rapid a different way? And I said, what way is that? And he said, well, just follow me. You know, all these guys are going river left. We're going to start on river right. And he said, just stay behind me. And about a third of the way down the river, we're going to have to make, or this rapid, we're going to have to make a hard left. We're going to pull left. And we're going to do that so we don't end up in the biggest hole in the river, which is on this rapid. And I said, OK, I trusted him. And so we got in our boats, and I was following, I was really following him close. I bumped his stern with my bow a couple times. And then we got separated a little bit, and then I lost sight of him. And it seemed like I didn't see him for an hour. It was probably 15 or 20 seconds. And when I saw him again, I, I must have been in a trough, and he was on top of a wave, and vice versa. And when we finally got on top of a wave at the same time, I noticed that he was about 10 yards to my left. And right then, I dropped into the hole. My kayak had an orange front, and it had a yellow back. And the other boaters were out of the rapid and, and down in the pool below. And they reported just seeing yellow, orange, yellow, orange, yellow, orange, yellow, orange. I was spinning like a pinwheel, and then I swam out of my boat. I didn't think I was going to get out of the hole. I had a PFD on, a life jacket, but I couldn't stay on top of the water. I went under, I probably for 30 or 40 yards going downstream, I was under the water. I got to the surface, I took a breath, and I was buried again in this rapid. And I, 15 seconds later, I came up for a breath and I was buried again. And this repeated probably five or six times. And finally, I got flushed out at the bottom of the rapid. One of the oarsmen, brought a raft over. He said, scramble in. And I tried, and I couldn't. And I said, I don't have it. I am spent. And so he and his passenger reached over the gunnel, kind of flopped me into the raft like a tuna, and I just lay there. And then probably in five or 10 minutes, 
some other kayakers uh, brought my kayak and my paddle to me. They said, let's go. More rapids to run. Miles to go before we reach camp tonight. And all I wanted to do was lay there in the safety of the raft and the comfort. But that's not how we roll in the Grand Canyon. This white world, whitewater world of ours, Schumpeter coined it creative destruction. And he has never been writer, truer than he is today. Doctor bots are now better at diagnosing diseases than doctors are. Lawyer bots are better at researching case laws than lawyers are. Chess grandmasters beating computers, that time is over. That doesn't happen anymore. And I read yesterday that Elon Musk said that in 10 years, it'll be illegal for us to drive. Google on public roads in America. Google has developed cars that today drive better than we do. And that's going to develop and develop some more. So for 100 years, and I love to drive. I'm from the wide open rest. For 100 years, we got to drive our cars. And then suddenly, someday, 10 years from now, if he's right, we won't. You know better than I the changing world of education. Why would I go to a tertiary college when I can take courses online from MIT or from Harvard for free? By the way, Harvard no longer teaches accounting to its undergraduates. They tell the kids to go take an online course for Brigham Young. Take the glassy tongue and maneuver as necessary. We need to keep our heads in the game, but most of us don't. Gallup, the London School of uh, Economics, other research organizations around the world uh, regularly research whether we are keeping our heads in the game and whether we as adults and as leaders Stay engaged. A third of us do on a regular basis. Two thirds of us do not. Gallup, the London School of Economics agree on this. Two thirds of us are not. Engagement is defined by keeping our eye on the ball and focusing on the right things. And we're worried about our kids. We want reliability of outcome and we will not get it. We want all our efforts rewarded and they will not be. We want happy endings. And maybe we'll have one, and maybe we will not. How do our kids keep their heads in the game? I read recently complaints from Columbia undergrads who claimed that Ovid needed trigger warnings. These Ivy Liggers want to be protected from a dead Latin poet writing about Greek gods? Walter Russell Mead wrote a couple of years ago that we are raising house pets and expecting them to thrive in the jungle. I've never heard it put so well. You say, give me the rules of the new game. I tell you, by the time I publish, the rules will be out of date. So how do we discipline ourselves and our kids to enter this white water and thrive in it? The answer is, there are some mindsets we need to fight against and some mindsets we need to fight for. We need to fight against our tendencies toward cynicism. We've all heard the expression, whatever. I think that should be banned from our national vocabulary. I can't be a cynical husband, a cynical father, a cynical citizen, a cynical friend, and be in a leadership state of mind. It just can't happen. If we all, all of us here, were in a Marine platoon, how would we like to be led into a fight by a cynical senior officer. We need to fight the mindset of entitlement. The more our kids and we feel a sense of entitlement, the unhappier we will become. Think about it for a second. If I think I'm entitled to 10 things and I have only five, I will focus on the five I do not have and I'll become bitter about it. And it's the same for you and it's the same for our children. Finally, we need to fight against the mindset of victimhood. I will say here that kids can be true victims, and too often they have been. But once we enter adulthood, that mantle of victimhood needs to end. I could spend 10 minutes with anyone in this room who feels done to or wronged as an adult and explain how you invited that trouble into your life. I'm not saying that adults don't commit horrible crimes against other adults. I will say it's a very healthy exercise 
to imagine how we participated in that crime. In Games of Thrones, John Stone, or John Snow, newly promoted to head of the Knights, uh, went and whined to the blind old sage. And the sage turned to him and said, kill the boy, John Snow, kill the boy. That was the end of his advice. So we need to work with our kids and with each other to fight cynicism, fight entitlement, and fight victimhood. And we and our kids need to work on the mindsets of grit and gratitude. In Angela Duckworth here, you have a treasure in Philadelphia. Her work with grit has been ground shaking. Her most famous speech started with the plebes at West Point, and she accurately predicted which of those plebes would be the most successful cadets four years later. It wasn't the ones that came from the most advantaged backgrounds. It wasn't the smartest ones. It wasn't the strongest and most athletic. It was not the most handsome ones. It was the plebes who were the most resilient, the grittiest, and those who were able to stay with their eyes on the prize. Here's some good news. We can build the grit that Angela Duckworth says we need. First, we need a clear goal. In this case, how do we keep our heads in the game in a whitewater world? On the other side of these walls is the roiling boil. Some of us will lose our jobs. At the very least, our jobs and our assignments will change dramatically in the years to come. Through all this, we need to stay engaged and with the program. The second thing we need is physical health. If we're not feeling well, we want a bowl of macaroni and cheese, a remote control, a couch. I do and you do. But to exert our grit and our willpower, we need to be physically healthy. Our blood sugar needs to be right. We need to be on our game. And third, we need a regular reinforcing mechanism. We all need a partner, a peer, a friend, a boss, to give us regular and straightforward feedback about whether we're pursuing our goals in a way that's thoughtful and will be successful. Someone we need to trust us needs to tell us. Very few of us could be totally gritty all on our own. And then besides grit, there's gratitude. The happiest people we all know are the most grateful. Gratitude acknowledges good in the world, and it also acknowledges that there's God or a higher power. People that practice gratitude, besides being happy, are physically healthy, stronger, more resilient, and more satisfied than others. People that practice gratitude have it made. I lost my sight in a mountain bike crash in November. I was lucky I didn't break any bones. I was lucky my wife was with me so that she could lead me out of the backcountry. I'm lucky this winter I still found, was able to ski and kayak the spring and still ride a bike. I feel grateful that a good friend introduced me to a doctor at Johns Hopkins who may yet restore my sight. I met a beautiful woman from London and she said I looked smashing in my eye patch. I was very grateful for that. And although I find myself irritated on a regular basis, living in a two-dimensional world, having one eye is infinitely better than having none. Fight cynicism, fight entitlement, fight victimhood, fight for grit, fight for gratitude. And even if we fight the bad and we embrace the good, we're not home yet. There's more our kids and we need to bring in this whitewater world. First, very high adaptability. Darwin never had it more right. It's not the strongest that survive. It's the most adaptable. The ability to make decisions in an ambiguous world. We need to make calls all the time, and we're never going to have perfect information. Humility. Leaders are going to make mistakes on a regular basis, and we need to get used to it. The ability to sort well. There's a lot of fluff coming toward us. There's even more fluff coming toward our kids. We need to separate the wheat from the chaff. The ability to read situations quickly. Sometimes we need to read the water and we need to move. And the ability to be comfortable with discomfort. Great change and great comfort do not peacefully coexist. If you've got butterflies in your stomach on a regular basis, 
know that a lot of other people do too, including me. And you educators, how do you produce these great results in your kids and in yourself? Well, you're the educators. I'll leave it to you. But just remember, when we find ourselves out of our boats, really wanting a breath, that is the time we most need to bring our grit and our gratitude. Thank you. Oh, uh-huh.